work that you actually did in class with Mr Collier will form the basis of you know, your log book <coughs> and also your talk. So you'll be referencing that, that log stuff. But there will be stuff that you also have to do in your log by yourself that you hopefully have made a start on. Okay, so your talk is six to ten minutes about how you would direct the crucible. Now, sorry, um, what's the, how much does the log book weigh in comparison to the director's talk? Uh, it, it's not then marked separately. Your log is then used to um, augment your okay. your talk. Yeah. Right. Um, now, in terms of the talk, you'll notice <coughs> in your exam schedule that um, there are two times for drama. You're expected to come to both. They're both part of the examination. So you can't say, I know, I think somebody has said that they can't come on a particular day. If you are not here, then that is counted as not being at the exam. Because part of the exam is being audience for the other people. It's a drama, it's not English. You, know, you have to work to an audience. And obviously, you need to be that audience. And also, you need to listen to other people's ideas. So that you, you know, like if someone gives a really smashing speech, you want to be there to hear it. Um, so it's expected that you are at both um, of those times. I will put a list up outside that, uh, on that notice board of your, um, your order so that you know when you're giving your talk. Um, but like I said, you have to be at both. If you can't be at both, then you need to provide a certificate. It would be the same as missing any exam. Um, Okay, in your talk, you should give an outline of the main themes from the play that you're trying to convey. So obviously, it's the themes of the play that form the basis of your design concept. Because if that is what you think the play is about. And you need to then illuminate that through your set and your costume. Your set, your costume, your acting, your sound effects, all that are, all those are pointing your audience in a direction to say that this is what my play is about. Yeah, so we don't have anything that's just pretty or, you know, I just thought it was a good idea. It has to be part of what you're trying to say about the play. A director is always trying to convey meaning. Yeah? They're not, no director goes, oh, I just did this because I thought it looked good. So what you think the play is about is your starting point. And you need to know the play well to be able to talk about what the play is about. And generally I would start my speech with, with a discussion of that, but I'll talk to you more about how to structure your speech in a minute. Um, so the main themes of the play that you're trying to convey. Now there's no point at this point in giving me an overview of all the thousands of themes that are in the play. I'm not interested, I, you know, I can look at that on the internet. I'm interested in what you think the play is about. Yeah? And what you're going to um, highlight in your design concept. Um, your design concept for set, costumes, lighting, sound and any other relevant elements of the production that you would use to convey your interpretation of the play. So these things need to be dealt with obviously separately but they also combine. So lighting obviously has a big impact on your set. Um, lighting can become part of the set. But you need to touch on all these things. Uh, set, costume, lighting, and sound. Now, in terms of the emphasis in this particular task, last year we emphasised costume a lot. You remember thinking back to Greek theatre, and we just did a whole thing on, on costume. I would be expecting you to use your understanding that you developed of costume design from last year and put it into that. Now, I know that you weren't here, and you not necessarily a disadvantage because the emphasis for this year is not on costume. 
Okay, you have to talk about costume and it would be great to see a sketch of a costume, but the emphasis this year is on set. Yeah, which is why you all had a workshop with Imogen on set. So while you would touch on costume and maybe show me a picture of a costume, I want you to talk mainly about set in terms of emphasis. And I'll talk about that a little bit, a bit later. Um, <clears throat> so your talk will include the main inspiration for your ideas and such things as the discussion of colour, the influence of historical period, mood and atmosphere. So in terms of the main inspiration, you at this stage, if you're talking about that in your talk, might go, you know, I was inspired by, I'm just going to pick anything out of the hat, I was inspired, inspired by Dr. Seuss. Here in my logbook is a picture of the images and poetry of Dr. Seuss that inspired me. Yeah, you could, you could do it that way. Or I was inspired by this particular historical period. Here are, yeah, pictures. Um, colour. Colour's real. Shall I? Sorry, just a quick question. So, can your main inspiration be like the time period of the crystal? So, like. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, your good. inspiration can be anything. Okay. Yeah? Thank you. But obviously, your inspiration is going to link in with your theme. Yeah. Um, colour is really important. So, in your log, you might have a page that where, I, where you've been playing with colour putting two colours together, putting three colours together and the impact of that, you might show that. You might talk about, you might have that page up and be talking about the mood that is created by those colours. So I'd be expecting you to use your, your um, PowerPoint of your log, with your pictures of your log, to show me that you have done some research, you've done some experimenting with colour, you know, it's not it's not just that you've come up with these ideas the night before. Um, so if I was doing like chaos and order, could I um, say that my inspiration could be when Othello was written because Othello is a lot about chaos and order in that story as well? Mm, I, yeah, I wouldn't be using so much a play like Othello as the main inspiration. But like that time period was written in? You mean Elizabethan, the yeah. Elizabethan period? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, and then you would use, be showing me stuff in the world to, that you've done some research on the Elizabethan period. So is the PowerPoint just like with pictures of your logbook in it? Like I'm a bit confused. That's right. Okay. So like all of your you've written pictures? your, no, you've written your speech, yeah? And then you've, you're talking about your research. You might take a photograph of a picture in your log that's to do with research. And while you're talking about your research, you bring the picture up of the log book research, you know. So I was inspired by uh, the Elizabethan period, as you can see here in my log book. I did extensive research on the gutters that existed as a joke, girls, <laughs> at that time. But when you make a joke about that just <laughs> Yeah? Um, or, um, you know, I experimented with colour and I decided that um, bright silver would be the main inspiration, main colour, because it creates this sort of mood. As you can see here in my blog, I tried about five different silvers. I think this one is a really great silver because it does this, that, and the other. Um, would you be able to, for um, bits in your PowerPoint scan pages of your log book, and put them on the PowerPoint, or no? Is it kind of separate? That's what I was just modelling. Oh, right, yeah. 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 <laughs> is that clear to everyone? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So you're saying you want the speech to be quite personal? Not only as a director, I would use these. Yeah, concepts. this is not an English speech. I'm not expecting you to stand up and very formally deliver. This is very how you feel. This is how you see the play, and I'm going to really tell you about it. Imagine, imagine that you're a director, and the first day of rehearsals, you've got a bunch of actors, and actors, what do they want to know? What am I going to be wearing? What is the space I'm going to be inhabiting? What is the, the world of the play? So often, first day of rehearsals, the director and the designer will make a pitch to not just the actors, but the producers, and 
even the marketing people of the show and yeah. give this kind of talk just so that people know what they're in for. In yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So you could pitch it like that if you wished. You could pretend that the people in the audience are actually your actors and designers if you want. Um, it should also include a discussion of the impact of your, your concept in two scenes from the play in detail. Okay, so you've outlined, this is what I think the play is about, this is what my set's going to look like, this is what my costume's going to look like, I'm going to use sound in this way and lighting in this way. Let me show you how that works in practice. I've chosen this particular scene from The Crucible. And the choice of scenes is really important. You are not going to choose two scenes that don't relate to your concept. So if, for example, what's, what Shakespeare are you doing this year? Uh, if you're doing Othello and you're really looking at the impact of jealousy, you are not going to be choosing one of Iago's main, main scenes because Iago is not the, the most jealous guy in the play. Yeah? Who's the most jealous guy? Othello. Othello. So you're going to be choosing a scene in which Othello discusses his jealousy. For example, the end scene where his jealousy comes to its penultimate point and he kills Desdemona and he talks to her about what a terrible person she was. That would be a good scene to choose if you were talking about that. So you need to think about the crucible and think, what are the most pertinent scenes that bring out the thing that I am interested in? Um. I, I know we don't have to put a, we don't put an emphasis on the costume design, but when we do do it ca character wise, do we have to choose a character that is in one of those two scenes? To I would, yes. Okay. So if you, for example, let's stay with a fellow. I don't want to do the crucible. If you're doing a fellow and you're doing jealousy and you're doing. Um, so for costume, you might want to talk about how you would costume Desdemona at the end of the play. Yeah, and this is just a little sketch that I've shown you of Desdemona. As you can see, I've decided to have it in modern dress. And then when you go to the um, the last scene, and you're please stick with me, girls, because this is really important. You you decide you're going to talk about the last scene. You're going to say, remember that costume that I had Desdemona in? Well, imagine her in that costume now. I've decided to put her in white to reinforce her innocence. I've decided to, you know, make it girly and frilly and have her with um, a, a costume that's buttoned all the way up to emphasise her virginity because so that shows how... Um, uh, a fellow, you know, must be clearly mistaken in his jealousy. Do you understand what I'm doing here? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So I'm bringing out the theme through costume, yeah? But in this discussion of the scene, you're not just going to be talking about costume, you would be talking about, and remember I talked to you about my set. Well, in this scene, the bed that I talked to you about is going to be wheeled forward so that it's central to um, the play, so that it's and this emphasises Othello's obsession with the sex that his wife is supposed to be having. Yeah? But I've decided to dress the bed in white frilly things that Desdemona has to emphasise that this is not a bed that... You know, I'm just talking off the top of my head. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah? And in the background, I'm going to have red velvet. I don't... Yeah? yeah? Um, now, the music that I told you about, you know how I told you in my concept that I was going to be using all the music from um, Baroque, the Baroque period. Well, I've just, in this particular scene, the, I've decided to use a piece of music, a piece of Baroque music, but I'm, I'm, I've taken out the oboe so it doesn't sound really soft anymore and lilting. It sounds quite jarring and violent and this is going to emphasise the fellow's um, rage. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, in regards to the crucible, mm -hmm. um, are we allowed to, what we did last year, how we um, changed um, yeah. Antigone, the context of it, is that 
semi what we're doing now? Like, are we allowed to base it in a diff different time? Yes, I'm sure Mr. Collier, uh, and I know he has spoken to you about this. What there are swings and roundabouts to changing the period, particularly for the crucible. Much easier to change the period of a Greek play or a Shakespearean play because they are so incredibly universal. Yeah. What is the deal with the crucible in terms of period? Maybe because it's based off a certain event that kind of happens, so it's a bit harder to change when mm -hmm. that event happens. Yes, yeah, so it's very specifically in, in that, that um, Salem witch trials context. Well, Greek, tra not tra Greek plays usually have uh, a storyline that you can alter and it will still not change you know, the whole Bands. idea of it, whereas if you change mm -hmm. Crucible, the whole thing. Yes. Like it would be so let's imagine, for example, putting the crucible in um, full on 1950s garb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the tight dresses and the, I mean, the tight waists, and you know, is that going to work? Mm -hmm. Are we going to believe that Abigail? Yeah. However, that doesn't mean that you can't change the context. Or you can't make it universal, you just have to be careful. So your production, your excellent production, what, were, what was Mr. Collier doing in costumes there? Were they period? Yeah. Were they? Yeah. Oh, no, they Who's were done any way. research on... We didn't have the waistcoats and all the stuff like that, we just had the long skirts. And the were the long skirts the sort of skirts yeah. that they wore in Puritan? Yeah. yeah. No, they were not. Oh, they were? Yeah, wrap around skirts, girls. They're big round pieces of, of black material. Wasn't that so But they had long skirts. Long skirts. Yes, they had long skirts. Yes. They're not wrap around ones. But they didn't black have those skirts. They wouldn't have been nylon or whatever those skirts They wouldn't have been nylon. They wouldn't have fallen in that same way. Okay. Yeah. What did you wear on your heads? Stockings. stockings. Did they rock stockings in? No. 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 What did they wear? Bonnets. 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 Yeah, white bonnets. So, what was Mr. Collier doing? Appropriating. Appropriating, yes. So, he's taking certain aspects of the period, but, you know, I could equally have said that those skirts and those black stockings belong to wear. Very modern. Uh, Quaker yeah. or Amish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought, I thought yeah, they could have been Amish. Where Amish else they could have, they have come from? Those black stockings. Japan. Yeah, Japan. 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 Yeah. To me, they yeah. reminded me a little bit of turbans or, yeah. you know, like an Islamic sort of thing, yeah? So, so we're the context there. for that was quite universal in a way. Yeah. Now, what that also so that's interesting. Yeah, because I wasn't jarring. I could still imagine that these you were Puritans, but I could slightly imagine you were somebody else as well. So, if you want to make a comment on another period or another time that these play that these themes belong to, that's probably the way to do it, rather than making them really specifically a period. Just wait two seconds. Now, there's something I want to bring up with you, which is slightly disturbing, that you thought that those skirts were Puritan skirts. What that tells me is that your research of the period hasn't happened. And I would be assuming that if you are going to set it in that period, that it has to happen. Yeah, 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 I know. You didn't think about it in depth, but I, I'm just talking about what. So, what will happen, what I find quite often, is girls go to design costumes, and I don't want you to do this, it's just why I'm telling you now. You go to design costumes for the Puritan area, area and you go, oh, yeah, they're long skirts. So, you just, you know, you give me something like that, and you go, oh, yeah, that's the period. You know, and it's not. Which is why we did the thing last year where you had to really research the period. If you're going to do Puritan costumes, and I know a lot of you have drawings in your log, you have to look. 
what were they doing with those Puritan costumes? You know, like, where, because an Elizabethan bonnet, bodice, for example, looks very different from a Puritan bodice. Very different. Yeah, of the long skirts that they wore in the 1900s looked very different from the long skirts and I'm just doing a silhouette here that they wore in Elizabethan times. If you give me that when you mean this, you've got a problem. So you have to, whatever period you choose, you have to do the research. The costume designer, you know, they do the research. They really know. If you do costume design at NIDA, I borrowed some of those costumes that Mr. Collier would, having been to NIDA, know all about this. They are amazingly finical, finicky about the details. Like, you know, some of them, if they're really going for an historically accurate costume, they actually don't have the, the fastenings that we would use nowadays. They, they're using old-fashioned fastenings and stuff like that. That's if you want to be incredibly accurate. So now I'm going to confuse you even further. Because you have to do that research, you have to know exactly what it looks like, and then you can play with it. Okay, so a costume designer will do the research on the period and then go, okay, I'm going to keep the bodice, but for a very specific character, I'm going to make the dress narrower. And everyone else is going to have this wide one and she's going to have that. Now, no one in that period would wear that narrow costume but they've made that decision for a particular reason, yeah? So when you did the, and the costume design um, pages are back up on your portal from last year so you can have a look at them. When we did the modelling of that, like a lot of the colours that were used in the modelling of that costume from Twelfth Night were not colours that they would wear back then. But they're, made, they're making choices about that. So we're allowed to do that? We're allowed to appropriate with colour? Completely. You, you're a designer. You're allowed to do anything you want, just so long as you justify it. And if you do something and I go, this girl has no idea what a Puritan costume is, then you get marked down. Yeah? So you can make any choice you want, just so long as it's researched and informed, and you can justify it in your talk. And I can tell that it's not coming out of ignorance. One of the ways status would have been indicated would have been the quality of fabric you could afford in um, those times too. So, yeah, certainly at night they would have an awareness of what fabrics were available. Yeah. And then they may throw that out, but at least they know about it. Yeah. Okay. So you should discuss why these scenes are particularly important. We're back to the scenes. You're choosing your two scenes. Yeah. Why they are particularly important to your design concept and how you would use the elements of production as well as the actors in these two scenes to reveal your concept. I have to talk about acting. So John Proctor in this scene, you know, what is his most important line in terms of the themes of your play? How are you going to bring that line out? It could be through the blocking. Maybe at that particular point, everyone's looking at him. Maybe you've decided to put him on a higher level when he says that line. Maybe he's lit in a certain way. <laughs> what? No, it's just a saying. It's like a slang. It's like a slang. It's like, this is lit. I mean, it's like really cool. It's like sick. And you're like, maybe he's lit. And how do you say? Maybe he's lit. Like, you like, I lit a fire. So John Proctor was lit. Okay, there you go. John Proctor was lit. So you could talk, you know, for example, about that, but also in terms of your acting, like you might talk about pace. 
how we are actors going to handle the pace of the particular scene. Is this a slow, ponderous scene in which you're talking to your actors about really using the pauses? Is there a pause before a certain line? Or is this one of those scenes, and there are many in the crucible, where the tension is high and you know you want your actors to be delivering their lines short and quick until they get to a certain point? Yeah, how are you going to, tension is a really interesting thing to play with in terms of your actors. How are you going to bring that tension out? This is where you will distinguish yourself from other students. It's a very top drama student that can talk about really how they're going to direct the actors. Most people can talk about set, costume, lighting. It's hard to talk about how you're going to direct actors. You might need to understand theatre. Um, okay, so two scenes. Now, if I was choosing two scenes and I had a particular theme, I'd probably go with the scene from early in the play and then a scene later in the play that shows some sort of progression or change. Yeah. Now, this brings to me to this idea of back to this idea of themes. So I heard um, somebody say that they were looking at chaos and order and <coughs> stuff like that. And I know Mr. Collier's spent a little bit of time, as have I, talking to you about that it's not enough to just say, oh, I'm looking at um, rigidity versus, you know, conformity versus freedom. Yeah, any play you could just say conformity versus freedom. It's, <coughs> this play is, a, it's a moral tale. <coughs> Who is the central person in this play in terms Proctor. of the Proctor. You've got to talk to me about Proctor's journey as how it relates to your play, because otherwise there's no point in putting this play on. Arthur Miller wrote this play as a moral tale. It's supposed to teach its audience something. It was put on during the time of... Um, the Red Threat, you know, the McCarthy trials, as a message to the audience about history integrity <laughs> and history repeating itself, like all those sorts of things. So if you're going to talk, for example, about conformity, you need to tell me how John Proctor's journey teaches me something about conformity. And I would, I would say to you that this play is telling you that conforming is not a good idea. And that John Proctor struggles with that throughout the play. And in the end, he, did, he chooses his own personal truth against the truth that is trying to be pushed upon him. Yeah? You need to be able to relate your theme to his journey and to what the audience is supposed to walk out knowing. I mean, the audience is supposed to walk out of that play going, I don't want to be Danforth. I don't want to be Abigail. I don't want to be one of those people that just does what everybody else does. I don't want to let my morals go. Lucy, I can tell when you're not looking at what you're supposed to be looking at. I want to be like John Proctor. I read that play and I go, God help me please, I want to be like John Proctor. You know, like if push comes to shove, I want to be the person that stands up and does what's right. At great personal expense. So you should scan pictures from your blog into a PowerPoint presentation that will aid you in conveying your ideas to the audience. So you'll be assessed on the level of sophistication, your design concept, your understanding of the play. Like really do you understand the play or have you just read something about a theme in the play and tried to plaster it on? What does this play mean to you? Um, are we allowed to... Google um, interpretations of the play and quote them and say like from this person mentioned this and I can relate to that as a director. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't do that too much because yeah. it's a lot like of once. other people, but yeah, to show your research and your
le level of sophistication in your support material. So your drawing of your set, you know, <coughs> is it some really daggy drawing that looks a little bit like that, or your costumes, or is it something that you've spent some time on? What if they, you've spent a lot of time on it, you Control. We can see that and then we'll pay it. Yeah, just as long as it really looks like you have made an effort. Yeah. And somehow somehow made things clear to us. Um, the effectiveness of your oral presentation skills. So even though that this is more uh, relaxed than say an English speech, you have to rehearse it. Yeah, In, you have to be within time and all those sorts of things. Okay, so you need to develop a design concept, you need to do, re do research on the play and its period in your log, you need to research the themes in your log, draw two costume designs in your log, sketch ideas for set in your log, show what sort of a stage you will put your play on, why have you chosen this stage, how will you handle scene changes. Yeah, so there are quite a number of location changes in the crucible. I would be expecting when you talk about your set for you to tell me how you're going to handle those. If you tell me you're going to use a revolve, I'm going to say you're lazy. Yeah? Easy to use a revolve. Yeah, now there are great, and it's not to say that you can't use a revolve and really use it well. So last year we saw that, uh, the use of a revolve. The arms and the man. So in terms of the themes of the play, which to me was about the, you know, the revolving door of violence, the fact that violence done to you then becomes violence done to another person, that revolve, that sense of things going round and going round, became a metaphor for that. And it was just a beautiful set. And you didn't need that to change the set. Because every scene actually looked exactly the same. So I, but what I don't want you to do is go, I have no idea how to change scenes, I'm just going to use a revolve. Yeah. Now, remember the, the theatre that you've gone to see. The days of, I'm going to have this whole set, and then I'm going to have a blackout, and then I'm going to have a huge scene change and take millions of things out and put this all back in and then voila, the lights come up and it's a whole new scene. Those days are long gone. That's 19th century melodrama. Yeah? You need to be thinking modern and you've seen a lot of modern plays now. Is it okay if like, we just organise the set so it's kind of flexible? Or is that lazy too? No, that's how we do it now. Okay, so that's fine. If you yes. like, I've just made it so it's... Okay. Yeah, but you need to then explain how it's going to work for all okay. different things. So, for example, you know, you're going to have to change it in some way. Because Betty's bedroom can't become uh, John Proctor's living room, can't become the anteroom of um, Salem without some change. Uh, maybe minimal, but some change. Would we have to talk about the scene changes between every act or just the acts that you're doing? Like if you're doing one at the end, you could say, and then from, at the end of the time, you'll change it to the next scene like this, and then if you're doing one from... No, I'd be expecting in your discussion of the set at the beginning that you tell me how you're going to change from scene okay. to scene. And that's where you use your grid. Everyone's got their grid with the different scenes in it, in your log. You did it for homework, I know. That's where you're looking there and going, oh, yeah, location, right. How many locations have I got? Ah, oh, I've got this number of locations. How can I do that? Yeah, so go back to your grid and have a look at it. Basically, you just want us to have like a set that, uh, that accounts for the, not just one kind of thing, just that makes sense. That's right, yeah. Doesn't mean that it has to stay the same all the time. You can talk about how you're going to change it. The actual like structuring of the speech itself, rather than like just what we have, like what we're in the hoodie. I'll talk about that. You'll, you'll talk about that. Yeah. Because so like, yeah, okay. Um, so have to do it. Okay, and then you've got your marking guidelines. Okay, so now I am going to go on to the structure of your talk. Okay, what do you think you would probably need to start your talk with? Like a 
overview of of like the period in the play and what it's kind of or maybe like the theme. Like I think this is the main thing. Introduce your theme, like in context to the play and the setting and everything. Yeah. So would you say like my idea is like chaos and order is on the same form and set, but like chaos and order is in this play set in and like how like sort of introduce your idea. I think you're getting a little bit probably too complicated. Yeah, I would probably just start with your theme. Yeah, what what do you think it's about? Yeah, the crucible is about. To me, the crucible is about this. Um, are we assuming that no one like it's a play that no one's heard of, or are we assuming that everyone in the audience has done it? You're assuming that everyone has done it, but yeah. you're not going to leave huge holes. Yeah. So we don't need to be like, the crucible will set the No, I don't, I don't want to hear information. Like comment, yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm interested in what theme you're dealing with. You're dealing with. Don't give me an overview of everything. Yeah? What do you think the play's about? You need to flesh it out enough that I get you know what you're talking about. So, and this is what I found last year, people were a little bit skimpy on this, and I think they're skimpy on it because they don't really know, really, what that thing means. So, in your discussion of the thing, you know, I want moments in the play where that thing comes out. You know, it begins here, and Proctor's doing this, and that shows this about this theme, and then this happens, and the audience realizes, you know, what's he going to, all that sort of thing. You know, step me through the play in terms of your theme. Explain to me the audience's journey in terms of your theme. You know, quotes. Now notice that I am stressing the audience. You are a director. A director directs for an audience. So you're always talking. This is not an English speech. About the themes are this. Blah, 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 blah. I want an audience to be thinking this when John Proctor says this line. But then Abigail does this and the audience is taken aback and they're thinking to themselves, am I like that? Blah, blah, blah. And then the tension really increases and the audience is thinking, uh Yeah, you're talking like an audience member. Thank you. Okay, so you start with your theme. And you really need to do that in enough detail that I get it. But again, like I said, as a director, talking about director and audience and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so then you would go into how you're going to use the elements of production. To bring out that thing. What are your elements of production? Set, lighting, mm -hmm. costume, camera, sound, um, actors, actors. Would you suggest that? Well, like, would we have like a couple of sentences on each one, or would you try and like integrate them? No, you need to other? integrate it. Again, it's not like a dry English speech. Yeah. It's like really, the more you can take me there make me see it on stage, the better. Is blocking an element or no? They're not an element of production. Element of production is the things that go into, you know, creating what you see when you go on stage. But you could then talk about um, the um, elements of performance. Casting? Yeah. Such as casting, blocking, yeah? But you would really be getting more into blocking and stuff like that when you're talking about your specific scenes. So when you talk about like integrating, does that mean, so say I was setting mine in the Elizabethan era, so like if I was going, oh, this is my set in Elizabethan, then I would kind of go like, my costumes are coming from there. Like you kind of not, you'd mix them all together. So if you're talking about one part that kind of relates to another bit as well, you'd kind of include them all. Yeah, 
So they don't, there doesn't need to be a kind of clear, I know that it's hard to kind of break away from the English way of writing speech, but you do it in kind of separate bits. Do you do it in points then, and then just bring in each kind of aspect of production? Or do you... I think you need to write your talk and just see how it goes. Yeah. Um, you know, I would be expecting that, you know, now I'm going to tell you about my set. I want a good block about set, yeah, because I need to see it. Yeah, well, you do that level of integration when you're talking about the specific scenes. Okay, so then, so you make it more clear when you're doing like set, like the costume, and then you make it, yeah, okay, yeah. I have two questions. The first one, so when you're talking about the elements of production, you're talking about the set, that's like a whole, is that what you're doing for the scenes, or is that just like the set as a well, if you're talking about the set as a whole, you're then going to tell me how your set's going to handle scene changes. I mean, as a set, you really need to be thinking about it as a, as a designer. As a set designer, I'm thinking this is what my set looks like, but one of the key things that I have to handle as a set designer is how am I going to handle um, changes in location for that specific set design thing. Um, okay, and also in the like intro kind of, should we give like a bit of a, a background history of like the McCarthy and like what if it's relevant to your concept, yes. Okay, if not, just if you're gonna... If not, you don't, you don't have to, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, also, if you are adapt, adapted, like appropriating something to the crucible um, as a thing, would you in integrate that with your opening sort of discussion with like what do you mean? So like like for instance if I wanted to include elements of another period within um, like within this instead of just taking it pure purely yeah. yeah. within that context. Would I introduce that within Well I would probably actually go into period here. Yeah. Okay. So I mean it really depends on your talk and how it's going. You're gonna to have to talk about period at some point. Yeah. And I, I think depending on when you set it is going to be going to influence how you do it. But probably there might be nice because then you can talk about how it's influencing your set, your costumes, and things like that. Did everyone get that I just sort of slotted that in there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So once you've gone over, this is what my set's going to look like. This is what my costumes are going to look like. You know, I might use this sort of music or whatever. Then you go into your scenes. Yeah? So now let me tell you about um, a, a really important scene um, that has to do with conformity. I'm going to be looking at blah, 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 the scene where this happens. And give me a little, you know, like, summary of what happens in that scene. Very brief. I don't need to know the plot, but it's good to give your audience a, a remembering of, oh yeah, that scene's about that. Yeah? And then tell me, what are your costumes going to, what's going to happen to your costumes in there? Are your costumes going to be different or the same? What does your set look like in here? How are you going to bring out the themes? Now, it's the theme that I'm interested in. It's your concept in, in your discussion of these two scenes that I'm interested in. So if I can't see your concept coming out when you discuss how you're going to direct these two scenes, you will get a low mark. Same with elements of production. If I can't see your ideas about conformity or whatever like that in the costumes, then you're going to get a low mark. That does not mean that conformity has to come out in your set, for example. Your set you may be using to create the period of the play. So say you want to set it in the 1950s. No, 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 you wouldn't do that, so I'm going to give it as an example. You really think it's important to set the context in the 1950s. You might use just your set to show that this is the 1950s, but then you're doing conformity, and you bring the idea of conformity out in your costumes. You can do that. 
but you have to know what it is you're doing with each element. But you might want to bring out the idea of conformity in your set. set and then extend it into the costumes. So I am not saying that the theme has to run through everything because a, set, a, a director doesn't think that way. They try to do different things with different elements of production. But when you put them all together, the message comes through. So for example, if we think back to um, when we saw The Secret River, the set, what's the set doing? Is it creating context? Yeah, that beautiful big um, tree or escarpment or however you wanted to see that. Yeah? Um, it, it's creating a sense of the theatrical style because it's, uh, other than that, very spare. It's very Brechtian. We are reminded that we are in a theatre. We can see the lights on the stage. There's no hiding them. We can see that this is a piece of theatre because there's musical instruments at the side that people just walk to and use. Yeah. So he's creating context in his in his set, and he's also giving you a sense of the theatrical style that he's working with. What about his costumes? What were they doing? Were they creating context? Yes, so you wouldn't actually say that he's really creating a sense of period with those costumes. He's alluding to it slightly, but some of those costumes were quite modern as well. Yeah, the Aborigines were wearing jeans, which they certainly wouldn't have been wearing um, back then. So what is he doing with costume then? Mm -hmm. If you say, I'm going to appropriate, I'm going to go... What is he doing in terms of the audience? What are they getting? They're looking at those Aborigines strutting around in their jeans they and they're going them. what? Revisal. Pardon? No, that's related. <laughs> it's relatable in what way? As it's, it's something like similar to what they would wear and it's like more modern. And like yes, modern. yes. So if you stand up there and go, I'm going to appropriate the costumes of the 20th century, I'm going to go, no. If you stand up and you go, I want my audience to relate to the Aborigines that walk on stage. So instead of having them wear loincloths, I'm going to have them wear a pair of jeans. So they go, I've seen an Aborigine that looks like that and I treated him really badly. So the message of assimilation and tolerance and care about other people transfers to the audience. I'm going to go, yeah, you know how theatre works. Can you tell the difference? Yeah. Um, if we were to do like very Puritan costumes and not change them much, it isn't very true to the period. Would we <coughs> give us a less uh, chance of getting marks that we could get by choosing something that the audience would relate to better using modern? You costumes? need to think about the play. So you could very easily use Puritan costumes. You need to then explain the impact on the audience. Easy, no? Or is that okay? It's, it's an, you're, you're thinking in the wrong way. Rather than thinking about whether it's easy or hard, think about what is the message that you want to convey and what's the best way to convey it. If you want to show that these are period people, Puritan people, and you want to do that through costume, then say that, then talk about the impact on the audience. You might say, the risk that I take in dressing my costume, my characters in Puritan garb is that they won't relate to them. So I'm going to do this. Yeah. If we pick two scenes, like if we have a, our concept or our set design, and it works really, really well with some scenes, but not so well with another, but we don't choose those for our scenes, is that going to be like? That will we will mark you down. Okay. Because so we like, know the play, yeah, yeah. and I'm going. Mm, what are you going to do in the courtroom okay. scene with that? Yeah. Yeah. You you need to 
it needs to encompass uh, the whole play. Yeah. Okay, so you've gone to your scenes. You've talked about scene one, scene two, and then basically you do a conclusion. Now, again, in your conclusion, you know, the most important thing is what do you think? Pardon? A sustained concept. A sustained concept? For who? The audience. The audience. I want to know about impact on audience. I don't have to worry about going over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do. Well, like, I'm not going to go over 10 minutes. Um, I'd be surprised. You'll be surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, that's so that's the big point, the point that I'm making here, there are a couple of big points. One is you need to understand your theme. It needs to be, needs to have meaning to you. And it needs to be integrated into the play as a whole and into Proctor's journey. And the second is that you are talking like a director who works with set designers, costume designers, actor and audience. And that when you talk about this, you are talking about it as a piece of theatre on a stage with actors and an audience and that you are constantly thinking about the impact that your choices are going to have on that audience. You guys have seen enough theatre now and acted in enough theatre to be able to do that. You're not talking as English students, you're drama students. I'm going to focus like more sort of silly question, but would we reference to things like I would do this, or I have done this, or I will do this? I, you, I would probably be doing it in the um, future tense. I will do this, I would do this, yeah. Yeah? I shall, I shall. I shall. <laughs> Anything else? I would love to do that. So, um, also when you're talking about set, I should, I would like to have an idea of where your play is going to go. Yeah, are you going to do it in here? Are you going to do it at um, the Sydney Theatre? Are you going to do it at one of those little spaces in the Sydney Theatre Company that we've seen? Opera House, Belvoir? Where are you going to put your play and why? Can it be anywhere in the world? Yeah, yeah. on top of the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, just so long as I have some idea. You know, if you're going to choose a theatre that I don't know about, give me a picture of it. Yeah. Is yeah. the Rosalind one the one where they were really close? It was no, the Rosalind Packer was the big one. Where's the one where they were really close? It was like a really that was the Tasmanian, the Wharf one. Wharf. Should we just say, what would you say for that? The Sydney Wharf. Sydney Wharf. Maybe just Google the name. It's Sydney Wharf. You guys didn't get the Belvoir Street subscription, did you? No. No, that's what we But you've seen, because Sydney Theatre Company works in so many different theatres, you've also seen the Opera House. Yeah, that really long, thin proscenium. Yeah, we've never been there for school. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we have. Oh, your yeah. 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 Some people have yeah. seen it, yeah. But in any case, you've seen enough theatres. Yeah. You can do it in here if you want, but you need to be talking about that. Okay, how are we going to time? We've got a room one. It's 18 past two minutes. Two minutes. Um, now I know that a lot of people are daunted by this task. Same thing happened last year. People were like, oh God, it's hard enough. <laughs> what? And then they were fine. Yeah? And it's a, it's a really good task to get you starting to think like drama students. Yeah? Now I know that there's been sort of a lot of questions about also the group performance. If you look at your assessment schedule on your senior, you know, wherever you keep your assessment schedule, you'll notice that that's being assessed at the end of this term. So um, it's not part of the exam, yeah? 
you should be, at the moment, all we're doing is working on skills. Yeah, so you, Mr. Collier and myself are working on uh, viewpoints and you're very lucky because Mr. Collier has some circus skills that yes. he's giving you, which are, I, I don't have those skills, so mm -hmm. I can't impart them to my students. Um, I really don't want to hear this thing that I hear every now and again about they're doing this and we're doing that and you know there must be something wrong because yeah we we sit next to each other we know exactly what each other's classes are doing um, so no one's advantaged or disadvantaged some people just get fun extra bits that they can add yeah um, so that a notification will come out after the exam the, the idea basically is that you get the skills leading up to your exam, you do your exam in this, and then um, in the sort of three or four weeks that you've got after the exam, you're starting to consolidate and come up with a performance. I haven't, we haven't discussed how long these pieces will be. We're probably going to have a discussion about that at the end of this week when we know where you're at. Yeah. yeah. We sort of like to see what you're doing. Now the reason also, the reason that this is given and you sort of did it last term and now you're revisiting is that's the way the HSC works. You don't always, you know, you've got to remember things that you did ages ago and then regurgitate them like five months later for the exam. So I think this is good practice. Are we going to have a go at like practicing monologues or something like this? Yeah. I've taken it out of the assessment schedule. They did it last year. The reason I took it out is because just we didn't have enough time and what ended up happening is people got incredibly stressed. And I didn't want to do that to you. However, Mr. Conner and I have spoken and um, the Dolls House, which is what you move into in Term 3, has a couple of really long monologues in it which you will be working on. So you will get, um, even though it's not assessed, you will get time to perform monologues and use those skills. So the skills that you learnt in the Crucible and also the skills that you learn in a doll's house are directly transferable to a long monologue. I have said to my class, just very briefly, please don't think I'm definitely doing a um, monologue for the HSC. I'm not saying that you won't be doing a monologue for the HSC, but you really need to think wider, like think about director's portfolio, think about costume design, think about set design. I get Imogen in to work directly with the girls on set design. Generally speaking, we do much better in set design and in some of those heart, those portfolio projects than we do in performance. The same for any school, simply because you're up against 60% of people in the state when you do performance. Um, the other nice thing about doing one of those portfolios is that you can do it and just hand it in. You don't have that pressure of, I've got to come up with it on the day. So don't be in a set mindset about what you're going to do for IP. Yeah. Thank you. Long books are also important for group project, aren't they? Absolutely. In terms of recording every stage of yeah. development. Yeah. Very important. You should be working in your log. I get my girls to work in the log every lesson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.